Good morning. Good morning. Bonjour. Thank you. I wish to begin by recognizing that we're currently gathered on the traditional Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory. Welcome to the Canada Science and Technology Museum. Et bienvenue aux personnes qui se joignent à nous en ligne. Je m'appelle Christina Tessier, je suis présidente directrice générale d'Ingenium, Musée des sciences et de l'innovation du Canada. Ingenium gère ce musée national ainsi que deux autres dans la région, soit le Musée de l'agriculture et de l'alimentation du Canada et le Musée de l'aviation et de l'espace du Canada. Our three museums tell the stories of ingenious and innovative people, many of them Canadian, who dared to think differently. Our museums are places where you can learn and explore, play and discover. We hope there are places that spark your curiosity about the world around you. Today, we are incredibly lucky to welcome three astronauts to our museum here in person and through our live stream. I have to admit, I'm a little nervous to be introducing such amazing Canadians to you today. So I'm going to ask our astronauts to stand up as we introduce them. First, former member of the Canadian Astronaut Corps, Dr. Roberta Bondar, who now runs the Roberta Bondar Foundation. <laughs> Canadian astronaut, Dr. Jenny Seide Gibbons. <laughs> and Canadian Space Ag Agency astronaut, David Saint-Jacques, who will join us shortly from the International Space Station. <laughs> the teachers and students who are here with us in the auditorium are from three Ottawa schools. So let me hear you when I call out your school name. Faites-vous entendre quand je nomme votre école. École élémentaire catholique La Véhandry. École élémentaire catholique Saint-François d'Assis. Canut Public School. <laughs> Feeling a little excitement in the room. That's good. So students, I'm going to ask you to make me a promise today. Days like this can be transformational in your life. To have an opportunity to talk with astronauts, to talk through a live stream with an astronaut who's at the International Space Station. If you look back on this day, and it is a day that sparked your lifelong interest in space, technology, engineering, I want you to come back and tell us your story 10, 15, 20 years from now. This museum will still be here. I probably won't. But please do come back and share your stories with us. So before I turn things over to, doc to astronaut Dr. Jenny Seide Gibbons, I want to mention that today, January 22nd, is a special day for Dr. Bondar. It was 27 years ago today, in 1992, that Dr. Bondar launched into space aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery for an eight-day mission. And this isn't the first time that Dr. Bondar has been to our museum. She was here in 1992, shortly after she had returned to Earth from her space flight. Welcome back, Dr. Bondar. Parmi les élèves ici aujourd'hui, qui sont ceux qui aimeraient devenir astronaut pour parcourir l'espace? Who would like to become an astronaut? I see a few hands out there. Et encore, qui aimerait dans le futur travailler comme ingénieur aérospatial pour participer à la construction d'une future station spatiale ou d'un rover? Levez votre main. Oui. Les sciences et les technologies permettent aux humains de voler dans l'espace. Et ce matin, les sciences et les technologies nous donneront la chance de parler avec l'astronaute David Saint-Jacques, qui est en orbite autour de la Terre sur la station spatiale. J'espère que l'événement aujourd'hui vous inspirera à réfléchir aux incroyables contributions des sciences et la technologie sur notre quotidien. We are thrilled to have this opportunity to work with amazing partners to develop an educational tool that brings astronaut David Saint-Jacques' mission into classrooms across Canada. Stay tuned today for details. The conversation with David will start in just a few minutes. Before we begin, please welcome to the stage astronaut Denny, Dr. Jenny Seide Gibbons. Merci, Madame Tessier. Je suis très contente d'être ici avec vous. Now, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Thank you for having me. It's exciting for me to be able to share uh, bits of David's mission, all that I can with you, and also be able to be in the presence of people who are my role models, like Roberta Bondar. Um, it's a very exciting time to be part of the Canadian space program, especially because David is in space right now. Now, space provides us with a unique vantage point from which we can understand the complexity and the intricacy of our planet. 
Canada has been a leader in the field of space observation for 25 years. And using satellites, we take images of our planet and of Canada every day to monitor ice, our environment, agriculture, our coasts, as well as detect ships and support relief efforts during natural disasters. In fact, Canada will be launching Radarsat Constellation Mission to Space later this year to help with just that. But there's more than one way to look back at our planet. Some get to see this view with their very own eyes. David, currently in space, recently commented and said that he's completely taken aback by the incredible beauty of our planet. But it's not just a beautiful view. The perspective from space can help us understand the geological, environmental, and ecological systems that we live in every day much better. And indeed, part of an astronaut's work while aboard the International Space Station is to take beautiful pictures of Earth for research pictures, for research purposes, and to record how the planet is changing. The astronaut's point of view gives us a chance to appreciate our planet from a distance and gain perspective on its beauty, fragility, and history. So today, as we're here to launch a very special digital initiative using photos taken from space by David to better understand just how our planet works. I'm sure that his photos of Earth will make you want to protect it better, just like he does. Now, this web-based interactive project invites young Canadians to explore the science of Earth and tell its story. And to help tell that story, the Canadian Space Agency has collaborated with several partners, both for their expertise in education and Earth, scientists, Earth sciences. Ingenium, Musée des Sciences de Innovation du Canada, Le Société Géographique Royale du Canada in Canadian Geographic Education, Western University, and finally, Dr. Bondar and the Roberta Bondar Foundation. Now, Roberta was the first Canadian woman and the world's first neurologist in space. I really think that space exploration changes what we think is possible, and the people that do it help with that. For me, Roberta Bondar changed what I thought was possible uh, around 27 years ago. I remember my mom emphasizing how important her mission was as the first Canadian female astronaut in space, and that really stuck with me. Maybe I didn't realize how important that was. I was a bit younger than you guys when it happened, um, but it had an impact on me. And really, it set me on the trajectory where I am today, and now I'm able to share that with you. And today is particularly special because it has been exactly 27 years since Roberta launched into space. She's one of very few Canadians who has had the opportunity to see our planet from up there. And after her flight, she was inspired to start using fine art photography to explore and reveal the Earth's natural environment from the surface. At the Canadian Space Agency, we are very proud that she has accepted to collaborate in the Exploring Earth project, which we are launching today. Roberta, please join me on stage. Well, thanks for joining me. My pleasure to be here. What a grand day this is. Yeah, I know. Pretty exciting, huh? Well, I understand I came up here. It's going to be less than four minutes before we're joined by David on the space station. Okay. I'm just really excited about that. I don't know about anybody else in the room, but this is like so cool. And to be the 27th anniversary of my flight, memorable. I know. Special. Stars aligning, huh? <laughs> um, so while we're waiting for David, I have a few questions for you, Let's see if you like. Um, so, during your mission, was there anything that you saw that really had a lasting impression? Anything that touched you or shocked you? What was it like? Well, I must say that flying over Canada, and this sounds really kind of funny, but I had the Canadian National Anthem, and I remember hearing it being sung with a deep-throated voice while flying over Canada, and I must say that it brought tears to my eyes, and then I decided to do an experiment with all the tears around my eyes and shook my head, and all the tears went out like little, little balls of water. So that was kind of cool. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. Well, a scientist at heart. <laughs> um, I can imagine seeing Canada from space for the first time. I don't know how it's going to affect me, but I've heard from David and from our other astronauts who have seen it that it's pretty powerful. Um, how do you think that changed you? What did it change about your life? 
Well, one thing that, that I learned is that when we're in space, I don't know about everybody else, but I think for the most part, we like looking at the planet because looking away from the planet is what I call this light-sucking black. It's a black with no end. The stars don't twinkle because we're so far above the atmosphere. And the planet below has all these wonderful colors and patterns that we really can't appreciate when we're here on the surface. We have different patterns. I think that kind of, that kind of vision that this is a huge, massive place, I mean, you don't see it like the blue marble because they're not up high enough, obviously, but the patterns we see at the distance uh, out the window are quite extraordinary, and they change all the time. Seasons change, of course, but so does our view. Well, our changing planet. Um, can you tell us why you decided to join the Exploring Earth Project? This is a very interesting project. I wish I had had the ability to have this when I was the age you guys are, because to be able to look at a map of the world and to be able to click on it and then see some shots from space and find out about what's in that shot and, and train our eyes the way we have to, as astronauts, to be able to look out the window and see new things and to be curious about what's in them, uh, it's an extraordinary opportunity. And for the foundation, we're very interested in migratory birds. So we have this Protecting Space for Birds project that we've aligned with the Exploring Earth of the Canadian Space Agency and the Royal Canadian Geographical Society to put some of those migratory pathways that David hopefully will photograph from space as well. So it's really coming together very, very nicely. Wow, dovetails well, huh? That's fantastic. Well, I think, I think we're actually pretty much ready to speak to David. Um, Hopefully we're connecting with him shortly. So to start, what we're going to do is we're going to check the audio connection to make sure that David can hear all of us well. That's really important. Uh, and keep in mind there's going to be a slight delay in communication. So don't be surprised if David takes a few seconds to reply to your question or uh, listen to what we're saying. It's just the audio delay coming to the space station. We're about 20 seconds. And here you see this view is actually of mission control in Johnson Space Center. This is where we're going to link up with David. So this is like the, the brain on the ground that's talking to David and the other astronauts the whole time that they're in orbit. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Oh, look at that. <laughs> Houston, this is Station. I'm ready. Canadian Space Agency, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Jenny Seide Gibbons at the Canada Science and Technology Museum. How do you hear me? Bonjour, Jenny. I got you loud and clear. Ready to talk with you. <sighs> Wonderful. Hi, David. We are excited that you're able to join us today and help launch Exploring Earth with Roberta Bondar. I'm especially excited to hear both of your perspectives on seeing our beautiful planet from space. Hi, David. It's Roberta here. Merci, Jenny. Moi, je suis vraiment très content d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. <laughs> So, David, uh, we're interested here to learn about how you're looking out that cupola. We saw pictures and a little video that you sent uh, down on, online about opening the windows and letting the light come in. And then we have seen some pictures of you with the, with the cameras. Are you finding it a little bit easier in space to take pictures than down here in the ground with cumbersome ball heads and tripods? Yes, we can tell. Uh, hello, Roberta. Nice to speak to you. I know you're a seasoned uh, photographer, keen photographer. You, uh, you would love that cupola. It is an amazing place to take photos from. And uh, even the most giant lens weigh nothing, so you don't need a tripod at all. You can just leave them there and they stay. Actually, if they're long and heavy, then they tend to stay stable, so it actually helps. It is a wonderful place. It's my favorite moment of the day when I open those window shutters in the morning and I have the first view at the planet. And whenever I have a chance during the day, I float up there. And in the evening, when we close the shutters, I wave the bye-bye uh, to our beautiful planet. Well, I want to thank you, David, for taking the images for our Protecting Space for Birds project. 
Uh, it's uh, really wonderful for us to be able to combine our surface photography with our helicopter work and your space photography because uh, I understand even uh, this past week you were able to photograph one of the targets, one of the many targets we, we've given you. Yes, uh, thanks to a lot of people working hard on the ground. Uh, we get good planning, good provision, uh, good predictions of when we're going to fly over there. And I can show up, uh, grab the camera, and uh, do my best to uh, find the location and take a good photo. And if we're lucky, you know, you need good weather, of course, uh, but uh, uh, eventually we'll get through it. And do you find things are moving pretty quickly? I know that you're going very fast up in space, but when you look at the planet, do you, do you have to plan like a, an orbit ahead of time or... Do you get enough warning that you get up there and maybe photograph something that's still about 1,200 kilometers away? How, how, do you, how do you work that? So we get a, a heads up about three, four minutes ahead of when the, the location is right underneath us. And that's roughly when it appears over the horizon for us. Uh, so that's enough time. The trick, of course, is to be disciplined and keep your camera ready. We, got a, we have this uh, quiver of cameras in the cupola with different lenses, and we're very disciplined at making sure the batteries are fully charged, there's a camera, there's a, you know, a card for the photos ready, so we can just show up and uh, go uh, start shooting. Station on to... And do you, do you have a favorite place that when you look out the window you feel very happy when you see it and you, you, you know that uh, in another few orbits you might be over it again, maybe just a different perspective? Is there some uh, place that you really have, have liked looking at because of the color or the shape? Well, of course, uh, dear to my heart is the uh, province of Quebec, uh, where I was born and then grew up. And uh, it's a funny quirk of uh, timing. The first time I got a chance uh, to speak with my family on the phone, we were flying over uh, the province of Quebec. It's easy to recognize from orbit because of the Gaspé Peninsula, a very uh, nice shape and the, the huge... Uh, huge rocky areas uh, to the north uh, so and because it's kind of north on our trajectory we are at a grazing angle uh, so uh, we spend quite, quite a lot of time on northern areas of the planet so that happens pretty often so that's my personal favorite whenever I can get a, a glance at uh, the province I was from. David I want to thank you on behalf of the Roberta Bonda Foundation for participating in our migratory bird project hopefully We'll be able to show people the vast distances that birds also have to fly over the surface of our planet across borders that they can't see the way you can't see them from space. So uh, we wish you well on your, on your voyage and look forward to more of your photography and more of your insight uh, into how we live in space. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Roberta, for the opportunity to contribute. It's a beautiful project. And, uh, you know, we share this planet with many other species, and we have a responsibility to share it, uh, to be decent, uh, you know, decent, uh, if you want, the roommates with the other species on our planet. Thank you, David. I mean, it's just exceptional that you can share your mission with us in this way. Um, I know we're all pretty excited to hear about it. So uh, we actually have some students with us who are eager to ask you some questions to learn more about Earth and what you're seeing from the space station. Bonjour, je m'appelle Farron et je vais à Connet Public School. Quand vous regardez la Terre, qu'est-ce qui vous surprend le plus et pourquoi? Bonjour, Farron. Très belle question. C'est tout ce qui est le plus surprenant? Ben, D'abord, la Terre est extrêmement belle, mais ça, c'est pas surprenant, je le savais. Ce qui me surprend le plus, c'est à quel point la majorité de la Terre n'est pas vraiment habitable pour les êtres humains. On croit que la Terre est très grosse, c'est vrai qu'elle est grosse, mais la plupart de la Terre, d'abord, c'est des océans. 
Et la partie qui n'est pas un océan, qui n'est qui est pas submergé, c'est surtout des déserts ou des montagnes. Alors, les endroits sur Terre où les êtres humains peuvent vivre, c'est vraiment une petite fraction de la planète. Et puis après, on peut voir la toute petite couche de l'atmosphère dans laquelle nous survivons euh, euh, dans le vide de l'espace. Et ça me frappe à quel point, à chaque fois, le, la bulle dans laquelle les êtres humains vivent est minuscule et fragile et nous devons en prendre bien soin. Mon nom est Jillian Tran de La Vérandrie et moi je veux te poser une question. Pouvez-vous voir des désastres naturels de la station spatiale? Oui, euh, on peut voir des désastres, effectivement. Par exemple, euh, on peut voir des inondations très facilement. Si c'est des, des grandes inondations, j'en ai vu une la semaine dernière euh, en Amérique du Sud. On peut voir que les rivières sont, ont débordé de leur, de leur lit. On peut voir les éruptions volcaniques aussi. On peut voir la fumée qui sort euh, des volcans en éruption. Euh, ça, c'est, les, je dirais, les, les, les désastres les plus grands euh, qu'on peut voir euh, depuis l'espace. Je suis Nive de Kana Public School. À quoi ressemblent les ouragans et les tempêtes de l'espace? Bonjour, Nive. Alors, un ouragan vu de l'espace, c'est comme un immense tourbillon. C'est comme un nuage en forme de tourbillon blanc, avec au centre un trou. Et le trou, c'est la dépression centrale, là où le vent est le, est le plus fort. Et ça, c'est les ouragans. Et on peut voir les tempêtes. Ce qui est, tout ce qui est le plus beau, c'est voir les éclairs des tempêtes la nuit. Quand on vole la nuit au-dessus d'une tempête, c'est comme s'il y avait des flashs qui apparaissent un peu partout. C'est vraiment, vraiment extraordinairement beau de voir ça. Euh, on voit les, les nuages au-dessus de nous qui sont blancs. Et de temps en temps, pouf, il y a des éclairs de lumière qui apparaissent à l'intérieur des nuages. Bonjour, je m'appelle Judith de l'École catholique La Vérendry. Et ma question pour vous. Euh, Est-ce que vous pouvez voir les lumières des grandes villes de la station spatiale? Bonjour Judith. Oui, c'est très facile. La nuit, on voit toutes les villes. Et d'ailleurs, c'est très intéressant parce que durant le jour, c'est difficile de voir l'impact de l'être humain sur la Terre. C'est plus difficile. La nuit, c'est très facile à cause des lumières partout, surtout quand on vole au-dessus d'un endroit comme euh, l'Amérique ou, euh, ou l'Europe le, ou l'Asie. On voit des lumières. Toutes les villes, on les voit. C'est très, très facile. Et d'ailleurs, je m'amuse à essayer de deviner les, les villes d'après la forme euh, qu'on peut voir de leur lumière. Bonjour, je suis Aiden de Connet Public School. Pouvez-vous voir le grand mural de Chine de la station spatiale, ou est-ce que ça, c'est juste un myth? Aiden, très bonne question. Je me suis posé la même question et j'ai essayé de la voir, la muraille. Puis non, on ne peut pas la voir. Moi, je n'ai pas été capable, en tout cas. Je pense que c'est parce que la muraille, elle n'est pas continue. C'est juste des petits, c'est comme des petits morceaux. Ils l'ont jamais terminé. Ils ont fait des petits morceaux. Alors, c'est comme une ligne pointillée. Ça, c'est difficile à voir de l'espace. Moi, j'ai, j'ai pas réussi à voir. Peut-être que Roberta Bondar l'a vu. Vous pourriez lui demander. Et ma question est, est-ce qu'on peut voir un grand changement sur la planète entre l'été et l'hiver? Oui, Tristan, très facile à cause de la neige. Et c'est le plus, surtout impressionnant la nuit à la pleine lune. En ce moment, c'est la pleine lune. Et à cause de la pleine lune, on voit tout... Et lorsque c'est la pleine lune, durant la, la nuit, on voit la neige qui est éclairée en blanc et la terre, toute la terre brille blanche, même la nuit. C'est vraiment fantastique. My name is Russell and I'm from Conant Public School. What is your favorite thing on Earth to look at from space? Hey Russell, the most beautiful, amazing thing I've seen from here 
is the Northern Lights. Uh, it's just so incredible. They are, it's like green lights dancing over the horizon. They're below us, of course, when we're on space station. So imagine you're looking at the Earth at night and there's these like green, uh, it's like, it looks like green, fluorescent green smoke that's dancing over the Earth. It's just unbelievably beautiful. Hi, I'm Adele from Ecole Catholique saint françois d'Assise. Can you explain how you take photos of Earth from the space station? Bonjour Adele. Yes, so we, we have this beautiful bay window we call the cupola. It's like a half sphere of glass, basically. We can go in there and look in every direction. And we just take a normal camera, take a normal camera and uh, take photos through uh, the window. We have cameras with different, you know, size of lens. So we can take more f zoomed in photos. And, uh, and that, that's how we do. So it's just like taking a photo on Earth. Uh, you just got to, you know, adjust for the lighting and uh, take the best shots that you can. de l'école Saint-François d'Assise. Euh, Est-ce qu'on peut voir les frontières de l'espace? Bonjour Tristan. Non. On ne peut pas voir les frontières de l'espace. Euh, euh, Peut-être, peut, il y a une frontière qu'on qu peut deviner, par exemple, euh, quand il y a un pays où il y a plus de lumière dans les villes ou dans les routes qu'un autre, on peut voir la différence la nuit. Par exemple, entre la Corée du Nord et la Corée du Sud, la nuit, c'est facile de voir où est la frontière, parce qu'en Corée du Sud, il y a plus de lumière dans les rues. En Corée du Nord, il y en a moins. Donc, on voit qu'il y a une, une, une ligne, une différence de quantité de lumière qui vient de ces deux parties-là. Mais c'est très indirect. La frontière elle-même, non. Vu de l'espace, on voit que la Terre, c'est une planète et les êtres humains, c'est juste un groupe qui partage la même planète. Bonjour, M. Saint-Jacques. Mon nom, c'est Jade et je viens de l'école La Vérandry. Je me demandais si vous pouvez voir l'impact des changements climatiques ou la pollution de l'espace comme le smog au-dessus de la Beijing. Bonjour, Jade. Oui, on peut voir, euh, on peut voir une espèce de, de halo au-dessus des plus grandes villes euh, quand, le, quand il y a du smog. On peut voir, ce qu'on peut voir aussi pour les changements climatiques, on peut comparer les glaciers qu'on voit dans les montagnes avec des photographies anciennes des glaciers, du même glacier. On peut voir qu'ils ont beaucoup de glaciers ont diminué énormément à cause du réchauffement euh, climatique, à cause des changements climatiques. Ça, c'est deux effets euh, qu'on peut voir euh, assez euh, facilement. Bonjour, je m'appelle Clara et je vais à Connet Public School. Est-ce que vous pouvez devenir, devenir la météo juste en regardant la Terre? Ah, je peux voir le temps qu'il fait maintenant, mais je ne suis pas très bon pour deviner le temps qu'il va faire demain. On peut voir évidemment peut-être euh, s'il y a des, des orages qui s'en viennent euh, dans un pays. Un peu comme quand, si tu vois, quand tu écoutes la météo euh, aux nouvelles, hein, il y a des grandes cartes là où on voit, le, on voit les, les nuages qui se déplacent. Ça, c'est des prédictions. Alors, euh, on peut s'amuser à essayer de faire la même chose, mais c'est très difficile. Donc, même vu de l'espace, c'est difficile de, de prévoir euh, la météo. Hi, my name is Neil from Connet Public School. How do you recognize Mais the tu sais, je continue ma réponse. Tu sais qu'on utilise des satellites pour. I'm sorry. I just wanted to complete. We use a lot of satellites to uh, uh, to get images, and that's how the meteorologists uh, make forecasts about uh, the weather. So it's ultimately it comes from space. Hi, my name is Neil from Kona Public School. How do you recognize all the countries that you fly over? Hi, Neil. This is a fun game to play up here. If you go to the cupola, you try to guess where you are. It's just a test of your knowledge of geography. And if you really, for example, it's easy to recognize Italy. You know, the shape, it looks like a boot. It's easy for me to recognize parts of Canada because I know it better than other places. Uh, if you don't know, then we have a computer nearby uh, that tells us 
with a map of the world, and it tells us where the space station is at every moment of time. So then we can know where we are uh, when we look down to the Earth. A little bit like Google Earth. Hello, my name is Elliot from Comp Public School, and I was wondering, can you see monuments or buildings from space? And if yes, which one is the most visible? Yes, we can see, uh, you know, man-made, uh, human-made uh, buildings. So the most easily recognizable things are airports. They're very, very big. They're near cities. It's very easy to see the big, major airports from space. You can see at night, you can see highways. because It's like straight lines of light, the highways that have lights on them. That's also easy uh, to see. You can tell bridges sometimes if they're big enough, again, at night.